If it had said we're more, uh, television is more popular than Jesus, I might have got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but as I just happened to be talking to a friend, they used the word Beatles as a remote thing, not as what I think, as Beatles as though those other Beatles like other people see us. And I just said they are, are having more, in, more influence on kids and things than anything else, including Jesus. But I said it in that way, which is the wrong way. Yeah, well, yeah. Can't get out of my bed There's a thought crime running through my head Can't take these rules and people awfuls Who believe what they read and believe what they see Believe what they see on the TV Opinions are like iPhones Hello and welcome to episode 9 of John Lennon. I should say episode number 9. Today's episode is called John Lennon in 1966. And it's a discussion I recorded with a friend of mine called Owen Ling, who's a, a writer and an English teacher. And uh, Owen and I actually met in Madrid, I think in 2015. And he struck me at that time as a, quite an earnest young man and uh, slightly intense, I would say, in, in the best sense of the word passionate about uh, things that he talked about but he's certainly not intense in this discussion it's a nice light-hearted discussion but i think also informative 1966 was even by john lennon and beatles standards quite a year a year of uh, major tumult for them and for the music business so here i am on uh, easter sunday in madrid 21st of april i'm uh, no part of uh, semana santa this year it's holy week I'm immersed in various things, as I mentioned before, preparing quite a major blog post on the story of the Titanic sinking, which uh, the more I research it becomes more and more of an immense story in every way and of huge relevance in terms of society and the way it looks at itself and its relationship with technology and with nature. Of course, other things going on, the Notre Dame fire last week and Julian Assange's arrest. It's funny that uh, you can take almost any part of history any year and say that the world's going mad you know i think it just continues and brexit well i don't think anyone knows what's going on with that now but um we'll shall see what happens so anyway this is a discussion with owen we had a kind of loose structure to it to look at the events of the year um, news events and then uh, talk about music that wasn't john lennon and beatles and then go full board john lennon in 1966 and we had the usual fun and games with technology. One of us deleted 20 minutes of the conversation. I'd love to blame that on Owen, but uh, I think that was me. So you might hear at some point, I don't know if it'll be in the first part that you're going to hear now or the second part, but um, sound changes and there's a little bit of background noise, but it's no, it's fairly seamless. So I'll be back with a few words at the end, but now I bring you part one of my discussion with Owen Ling. Enjoy. Hi Owen, how you doing? I'm very well, Anthony. Long time. Yeah, how long has it been? A couple of years, three years? A couple of years since I was a 21-year-old teacher in Madrid. Yeah, it's more than a couple of years since I was a 21-year-old teacher. I wasn't a 21-year-old. <laughs> I wasn't a 21-year-old teacher. I was 21 once, though. I thought you were going to say you weren't 21. No, I was once, yeah. Oh. I can't quite pin down the year. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, stop. Well, I'm now the same age as John Lennon was in 1965-66. Ah, well, I'm past the age he was when he got shot, so there you go. Oh, well. Yeah, so I've survived yeah. longer than him anyway. Well, at least uh, you're not quite at George Harrison's age. Well, how do you know? I might be. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just past the age that John got to. Okay, so can you tell us what you're doing at the moment? And then I'm going to ask you about your kind of history with the Beatles and John Lennon. So. I'm currently in Italy and I'm sussing things out. Um, I, I won't go into what I'm doing in the job, but I'm doing quite a bit of writing at the moment. I had the pleasure of interviewing Chris Thomas the other day. Oh, wow. Great. So Engineer. that's for, yeah, he worked on the White Album. It was for a piece on Badfinger, which of course was named after one of John Lennon's working titles. Mm, that's right. Badfinger Boogie? Right? Yeah. Which song that was, was an early, with a little help, I think, because oh, yeah. it was something to do with the piano and he couldn't play it. Oh, Badfinger, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah. Who did Chris Thomas work with? I know he worked with the Sex Pistols. Who else did he work with? He did This Is Hardcore with Pulp. He did some of the Roxy Music albums with Brian Eno. And he did the Pretenders debut 
Pete Townsend Empty Glass and he's done some albums for McCartney. Is that producing or, or a mixture of those are all his producers. He was actually a mixer on Dark Side of the Moon. So he, oh, a lot of the yeah. track listing is thanks to him. Oh, yeah. I've seen the document, the classic albums thing. He was on that. Yeah. Yes. I think he made a brief appearance. OK, so can you tell us uh, when you first got into the Beatles and maybe because the podcast is actually about John Lennon. So could you well, mention yes. him as well? Go I could. Absolutely. Um, a lot of people get into the Beatles in the early 80s when they heard about John Lennon's death. I was eight years old in 2001 when I heard about George Harrison's death and through that heard about John Lennon. And when I was 10, because my parents were involved with Amnesty International and Fair Trade at a benefit concert, I heard Imagine for the first time. And mm. at that time, I was swept away with the lyrics and thought, yeah, we could all live in peace. and Wouldn't that be lovely? Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, he gets and, a uh, hard time. I think I've mentioned this about the Imagine No Possessions line. Yes. But, you know, in his defense, I mean, you know who Pete Shotton is? Of course, yes. He's like, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, no, 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 sorry, I didn't mean to, yeah. No, no, that's all right. No, he was his best friend at school, for anyone who doesn't know. And I remember there's, there's a really good book. There's some great um, anecdotes. And one of them is that they tried to go to a normal pub in London, and it was just a waste of time because after five minutes, someone came up for an autograph, and then John Lennon signed it, and then within half an hour, I mean, he didn't get mobbed as such, but it was just people coming up to him every two minutes. So <laughs> Famous people, yeah. rich famous people do actually need bigger houses to some extent you, you could make the defense that he he was hoping for this ideal himself and he didn't know if he was yeah married. yeah i mean exactly i mean it, it's very easy to call him a hypocrite so i imagine yeah he's saying imagine no possessions and you know you mm -hmm. can say it's idealistic or whatever but uh, um is there anything that marks him out from the other beatles to you or when you well, first got interested or now well i suppose um I will have to admit that Paul's my personal favourite Beatle. I think just I'm very into the intricacies and the versatility of the music. And through websites, We Are Cult and Culture Sonar, I've had the pleasure of interviewing some of his collaborators. John Lennon's lyricism was something that took to me when I was 10, um, like Help and Imagine and I Am the Walrus, the battiness of that, superb. Yeah, I talked to um, Rod Davis, who was in The Quarrymen. Uh, he was actually replaced by Paul which was quite funny. Oh, God. And then he met Paul McCartney in 2004, which is nearly 50 years later, windsurfing. How random is that? That is quite random. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Rod Davis was kind of, I think I've already mentioned this in another podcast anyway, he was playing down the kind of um, lyricism a little bit because uh, I Am the Walrus came from a song that they all learned at Quarry Bank. But John Lennon did modify it a little bit. So, um, yeah, we were wondering because it's, him for me, I was five when he, when he was killed. So oh I never really knew him. Well, I mean, I wasn't mm -hmm. conscious of the Beatles at that age. So I think the question that I'd like to ask sort of people who are a little bit older is, was he marked out as different while he was still alive? I presume he was, would you say? Well, I suppose, like, I mean, you see people, you saw the influence he had in, like, early 70s America leading people down the streets. So I, he must have had, like, I mean, maybe uh, Ginsburg loved him. It seems that, say, musicians and people who wanted to pick up guitars and, and learn chords might have looked to Paul or George, but intellectuals, writers, poets, they all seem to garner to, to John. And if you read the Jan Wenner stuff, I mean, it's so passionate uh, the, and the adoration he held for Lennon. So he must have. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. As far as I know, Paul, George and Ringo weren't really political at all. I mean, Paul did give Ireland back to the Irish. Did he ever do anything political apart from that? Or well, I and I, I suppose I'm going to give myself a tiny bit of a plug for this. When I interviewed Denny Sywell, he said that this was completely out of the blue, but it was Paul just simply had to do it. And it might, I think mm. he also did Freedom, which is about the 9-11 attacks, and that's yeah, yeah. a risable piece of writing. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know anyone that likes that. I think it's Nick uh, from uh, If I Had a Hammer or something as well, isn't it? I would be my thing for freedom. Yeah. <laughs> I saw some weird clip where he's teaching it to Eric Clapton. Oh, going, God. Oh, I'll just play G, you know, a bit of blues, E minor, blah, blah, blah. He, he's kind of playing it down while he's yeah. telling him. You're talking yeah. to the best blues guitarist in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, freedom. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you what we're, we'll do today, uh, you and the listeners. Um, so we're going to look at 1966. So um, the title of this podcast is John Lennon in 1966. Now I'm going to try not to bore the listeners by going too laboriously through the year. But I will be going through a few dates. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to talk about key events, non-musical events in 1966. Then we'll look at non-Beatles music 
and then we'll go mm. full board on John Lennon. All right, because it was a uh, quite an eventful year. I'm looking forward to this. Album. My personal favorite Beatles album is Revolver, and Lennon's stuff on this album is just stunning. Fantastic. Okay. Yes. Um, do you know much about '66 as a year? Have you, where do you uh, see it in in the '60s? Well, growing up with New Order, everyone knows that famous quote: "The crowd are on the pitch. They think it's all over. Yeah. It is now." Yeah, yeah. I was going to say we could ditch all this and talk about England winning the World Cup for two hours. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, no, what? Maybe what we? I am Irish. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go down that road. But uh, no, we did uh, win the World Cup. That's one of my uh, chronology of events. But um, well, no, I mean, '66 yes, is. I mean, it's basically known as very much a transitional year. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, singles were gradually becoming albums, and you're going to talk about some albums later on. Yes. Um, I'm still not totally convinced that um, albums at this time were necessarily works of art. I think they were still often collections of singles with a few filler tracks. But I think there's three or four real seminal albums that we'll look at later. I think the other thing is that you can't ignore Vietnam. I think people have the idea that, that America was involved from 65, but they were actually involved a little bit before that while Kennedy was still president. He was, of course, president till 63. So in January, LBJ announces the US should stay in Vietnam until, quote, communist aggression has ended. Oh, dear. I mean, uh, well, another tangent, this thing about communist, you know. I know. Using this word communist, I mean, it became so blanket and it was just, it's like terrorist now, you know. There are terrorists out there, I'm not going to deny there are, but it's it's a sort of yes. catch-all, isn't it? Well, well, also, it's you could say that for, for using it for, for, for the militant communists, and everyone now uses communists as a pejorative. Yeah, exactly. Communist was a party, it was a political party, and... In certain countries, it's not actually as dirty a word as it is in others. I mean, in Italy, there's a communist party, and they're taken seriously to some extent. I'm going to come on to that, actually, when I talk about um, the Cultural Revolution. But anyway, so in March, there was a big increase in troops. And in fact, by April, there were actually 250,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam. I didn't really realize that. Wow. That seems like a lot, doesn't it? Also, there were thousands of anti-war protesters around, and they picketed the White House, they rallied at the Washington Monument. Again, I, I think people probably think that the protests were more 68, 69, maybe 67, but they were a bit earlier than that. Yeah. And then uh, just one more, in June, the uh, US planes started bombing Hanoi, which is obviously the capital. It must have been so strange for people that were conscious of the war to kind of be living their lives, sort of in suburban England, let's say, for argument's sake, suburban England or suburban Ireland. To yeah. know that around the world this horrendous stuff is going on. It must have been very weird. Have you seen The Wall with Bob Geldof? The Pink Floyd film? Yeah, yeah. Yes! I don't know if it's supposed to be Roger Waters' father or something to Barrett's father. I'm not sure. But anyway, the main character is a sort of amalgamation of Roger Waters and Sid Barrett. And there's a yes. brilliant scene where you you see um, his father is in the war and you see like these bomber planes going over and these huge explosions. And you see that obviously he's been killed. And then just at that moment, they cut to his wife sitting in a deck chair in the garden with a bird singing. It's just so incredible, this juxtaposition. War has been a kind of an obsession of mine. Not not a morbid obsession, but even when I was a kid, I was like, what is this all about? Why is this considered so normal? You know? Oh, yeah. And of course, when we get on to John Lennon, we'll, we will, of course, talk about um, the fact that they were quite, I wouldn't say eager, but they were very keen on talking about Vietnam and it was one of those kind of no-nos. Um, well, yes. I guess the other big event maybe in terms of war or not necessarily war but the Cultural Revolution which was of course Mao and um, you know we were just talking about communism a second ago. I mean listen to this for absolute madness. So they had uh, what was called the Great Leap Forward which was 58 to 62 which was basically trying to change China from an agrarian society to an industrial one and it was done mm. through collectivization and I mean, this happened with Stalin in Russia. The idea is that you can't have any of your own property, so they basically confiscated all the grain from farmers. Every single bit of grain, and I'm sure someone can correct me on the details here, but I know the basics. Every single piece of grain had to be surrendered, which basically led to a massive famine. I mean, you're talking about tens of millions of people dying. And also, they this is a t- topic for another day, this, this whole thing about socialism and communism. That on paper it doesn't seem such a bad thing, but 
you know, maybe it's more to do with humans and power. But basically, you know, all the resources were devoted to these industrial projects. So there was a food right. shortage and there was a famine. And, you know, in China, the numbers, they reckon up to 40 million. You know, it's just yeah. it's absolute madness. Well, if you're talking about destruction, don't you know that you can count me out? Yeah, there you go. But he mentioned Mao, of course, didn't he? He was carrying pictures of Chairman Mao. He did. I don't think at that time the full horror really came out because obviously it's a communist country. There's some they're separated, uh, you know, in terms of information, a bit like North Korea now. I don't think people well, really realised what was going on. But you know, you've got to love these euphemistic titles: the Great Leap Forward, and then when that didn't work, the Cultural Revolution quote-unquote, to preserve Chinese communism by purging remnants of capitalist and traditional elements. So they were against capitalists, they were against bourgeois, they were against yeah. revisionists who were revising Marx. But then, of course, where it gets really bad is when all the paranoia comes in and they start targeting right. other members of the Communist Party. So then, I you know. Know, who, who's your enemy? It's basically everybody, isn't it, really? It's George Orwell's nightmare come to life. Oh, there you go, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As for news not coming out, there is that famous quote from the 1940s of Charlie Chapman saying he could never have made the great dictator if he had known all the facts. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, you've got to love these euphemisms that are used. Just for the listeners, a couple of other euphemisms. Extraordinary rendition. Are you familiar with that, Alan? I'm not. Please tell me. Okay. Well, obviously, extraordinary sounds generally good, doesn't it? Extraordinary yes. rendition is basically when um, the U.S., abducted suspected terrorists again I, I won't go into this now but the word terrorist i kind of looked into it and basically i'm a terrorist you're probably a terrorist well i'm also <laughs> irish so you know <laughs> right oh, there, yes. <laughs> yeah but no i mean just just by uh, you know I, i've previously did a little bit of work with activists and i'm sure i'm on a couple of lists just to say that this terrorist thing is so broad but anyway extraordinary rendition was basically they were able to abduct suspected terrorists and, and extradite them to other countries to circumvent the laws of the country that they've taken them from, if that makes sense. And then they basically tortured them. It's abduction and torture. The other one, um, double tap drones. Do you know what a double tap drone is? No, this is very interesting stuff. Yeah, I mean, this is a really lovely, um, heavy irony. Well, you know what drones are, obviously, drone warfare. You drop a drone on very often mm -hmm. civilians, and then you wait a minute, and then when the rescuers come to try and tend to the civilians, and you drop another one on them. Oh, no. Isn't that lovely? Double tap. Doesn't double trap sound so lovely? And part of me wants to vomit listening to that. Sorry to sound so sarcastic, but, I mean, it's horrible. Absolutely horrible. It's hor horrific. Yeah. But, uh, you know, but... Euf euphemisms are part of, our, part of our world now. I mean, where would politics be without euphemisms, you know? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Another non Lennon, but a musical event was uh, July the 29th, the day mm -hmm. before England won the World Cup, was Bob Dylan's motorbike accident. Oh, yes. Yes. I mean, uh, I've talked on this podcast about like how visually different people like John Lennon looked. You know, if you take him from 65, when he, the fat Elvis period, he had put on a lot of weight. And then suddenly, 18 months later, he looks, I don't know, 20 years older, he's got like a moustache and round glasses and a kind of glazed look in his eyes. He had well, lost quite a bit of weight by then, though. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think drug... I'm not sure we've quite got to the bottom of what drugs they were actually using around that time. I mean, we know they were using LSD, but mm -hmm. I would suspect uh, there were a few other substances. Anyway... Well, I, I know that Paul hmm. around this time had developed a coke habit. Yeah, it was like a year or something, wasn't it? Yeah, and then yeah. he kicked it. Yeah, well, of course, certain drugs take away hunger, so the, John Lennon seemed to be obsessed with diet and people made a couple of comments and it, I think that started him off on um, some mm. serious dieting. But Dylan as well, I mean, if you do a comparison, look at Dylan in uh, 1963 at the Newport Folk Festival. He's very skinny. He's very, very fresh faced. By 66, I mean, we know he was doing amphetamine. There's a lot of rumors that he was doing heroin. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he just looked like a living dead almost. He looked very, very pale, had the massive hair, massive curly hair. And he just looked an absolute mess. And Albert Grossman, who was known for being, you know, quite ruthless, I guess mm -hmm. maybe managers get tired with that brush a bit too much. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd booked him on to, I don't know, maybe 30 more dates. And of course, 66 was the tour with um, the Hawks, who became the band, mm -hmm. where basically they're playing all what we would consider now is real kick-ass 
electric music and being booed everywhere. Unbelievable. Yeah, again, yeah it's such a strange duck to position, isn't it? But yes. basically, a lot of people think that he may have actually faked that accident. Have you ever heard that rumour? I've heard that rumour, yes. Mm, yeah. Obviously, it was a way to get him out of uh, these horrendous tours. But maybe if you look at it in a more innocent way, maybe just the rigmarole of the tours and the drugs have put him in a bad state and he lost concentration, you know? Well, one of the more outstanding attributes to I'm Not There, which was directed by Todd Haynes, was that they, they to further juxtapose that, they got Kate Blanchett to play that part. Oh, yeah, I mean, that was brilliant, yeah. Fantastic casting. She even looked like him. Yeah, yeah, and there's those great bits with the Beatles as well. There's just sort of oh, five yeah. of them. It's like a speeded up film. And they're all I suppose they're all supposed to be high. And they're yes. kinda of like uh, it looks like a sort of nineteen twenties. You know, those films always seem very fast. Yes. You know, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, when you see a video of like Jesse Owens as a famous sprinter, it looks like he's running the hundred meters in about four seconds. It does. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that's all about. Um yeah, basically other events. Uh, L S D was made illegal in October. First love in which, of course, we associate with the hippies of 67 that happened at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. Births and deaths. Well, Owen, February the 6th, 1966. I was keeping this a secret from you, but it was actually the day of the birth of Rick Astley. Oh. Which I think, you know, puts everything else of this year, it pales into insignificance, really. You couldn't give that piece of information up, could you? No. Uh. <laughs> I had to keep it secret, but I'm revealing it to you now. I don't know if you saw that thing that went round on uh, social media about Rick Hasley for Prime Minister. Did you see that? I did. That was wonderful. Um, oh, it was brilliant. It was basically, he should be yes. Prime Minister because he's never going to give you up, let you down, make you cry, desert you, etc. Desert you. Desert you. Say goodbye. Jeff Don't Buckley was also... <laughs> Carry on if you want. Come on. No, no, that's enough of the Rick Hasley. All right, I'll okay. <laughs> uh, Jeff Buckley was also born... Um, oh wow! He, di he died very young. He, I don't think he's in the twenty-seven club, but what age? He must have been twenty-nine. Uh, I don't think he hit thirty. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. twenty-eight, twenty-nine. Yeah. And then deaths. Uh, just going to mention literally three: Lenny Bruce, who was a hugely influential stand-up comedian. I think anyone who likes Bill Hicks and George Carlin, which are my two favourites, uh, should check out Lenny Bruce because he was a big inspiration. Alma Cogan who uh, may not be a very familiar name, but she was a singer in the 60s. She was a good friend of the Beatles. Rumoured to have had an affair with John Lennon. Everyone was rumoured to have had an affair yeah, with John Lennon. Yeah, Maureen Cleave, who we're going to talk about, talk about yeah. later. The other one, are you aware of Tara Brown? Do you know that, that name? The name sounds very familiar, but I don't know why. He was a, the Guinness heir. He was part of the... That's uh, why. Although his name wasn't Guinness. He was a friend of Paul McCartney's, and Paul apparently took his first LSD trip with Tara Brown somewhere near the end of 66. Tara Brown died on the 18th of December, which was around the time they were recording Strawberry Fields. Uh, I think and was that it. not the inspiration for A Day in the Life? It was one of the inspirations. I mean, John Lennon, we know, did smoke a lot of the green stuff, and his songwriting technique... It seemed to be almost classic stoner at that time. He'd kind of sit at the piano, kind of feeling around for chords, and he'd often like have the newspaper, and he'd just literally pick something out. So I think the blew his mind out in a car was Tara Brown, but then, of course, you got the famous um, holes in Blackburn, Lancashire. Anyway, so um, let's go on to music. So as I said, 66 was a year also when um, the kind of English concert tour, which the Beatles were a big part of, was kind of dying out, and we were moving from pop to rock absolutely because of course there was in there's this incredible thing that happened with the beatles that when they were in hamburg i don't have it with me now but i think the second trip which is when they played the top 10 which is 61 i think mm -hmm. they played 91 nights on the trot mm -hmm. which wow. i mean you know i mean there's that thing you know a lot of groups did punishing schedules in hamburg but only one came back the beatles which i absolutely understand yeah. And then you've also got the 10,000 hour thing, haven't you? You know, they, they got a lot of Gladwell, practice. yeah. And then they went from that, which is incredible, to doing basically 20 minute concerts. Well, and I, I read somewhere that actually Ringo ha played fewer live hours than Pete Best did. Ah, yeah, that makes sense. I think he did Hamburg, but obviously only with the Beatles towards the end of the, mm -hmm. their Hamburg days. 
but yeah i mean it, it must have been so strange and, and also of course they're even by 65 they're moving into experimental music it's going to be very difficult to reproduce live so they kind of got these two parallel worlds going on of, of playing pop songs Absolutely. live you know and then having all this other world basically mm -hmm. so um, i'm gonna throw to you for a bit can you tell us about some of the non-beatles music of 66 and we'll have a chat about that as you said, rock and pop music had entered a potpourri of changes. Mm -hmm. The Rolling Stones had accomplished the watershed that the Beatles had done two years earlier, uh, and they had an entire album of Jagger Richards credits. That was in April 66, and it was Aftermath, which is one of their strongest albums. It's the strongest of the Brian Jones albums, probably. Uh, so it fused riffs that bit more Indian than 12 bar. Blues rockers, the Yardbirds, opened the British July with the punchy Roger the Engineer firing the six-string prowess of one Jeff Beck. Of course, for some listeners will know that he he modulated the the sitar sound on an electric guitar on the, the brilliant uh, Heartful Soul. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. In America, the Birds had showcased their 12-string Rickenbacker sound with alarming veracity on the March single, Eight Miles High. And then American beat poets Bob Dylan and Frank Zappa had entranced listeners with Blonde on Blonde and Freak Out, a doublet of idiosyncratic pop records. But the most notably of all, Brian Wilson had orchestrated a symphonic rock record, which impressed a mass following, including the Beatles songwriting bassist. Paul McCartney thought God Only Knows was the greatest song ever written, an echelon of harmonies which played through the Fab's Watershed album that following August. Oh, wow. Very good. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've written? That you yes <laughs> oh, no, that's great that's fine that's great the only other albums i had of note i mean these are the people that i was kind of into simon and garfunkel brought out a couple of albums that year yes uh donovan brought out sunshine superman jefferson airplane's first album cream's first album yes and the who brought out uh, a quick one which included a quick one while he's away which was one of the first pop attempts at kind of combining three or four songs into one it's the first mini rock opera, definitely. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, they obviously did. Tommy was sixty nine, wasn't it? So paving the way. Freak Out was an inspiration for Pepper, according to Paul. Do you know that album very well? I know it quite well. Um, I personally prefer the Only In It for the Money album, quite ironically, but yeah. given that it satirizes the Pepper poster. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I think. Um, you know, we always kind of think of the Beatles as breaking a lot of ground, and, and obviously they did, but you got to remember that there were other people doing other things before them, and I do like Freak Out, but Frank Zappa is it's very rewarding in the end, but it, it's like you need to, it's work to get into yes. it, you know? And yes. I kind of like that, you know, because, I mean, even with the Beatles, you could argue, um, when I got into them, which was when I was like 13 or 14 or something, most people, I would imagine, prefer the early stuff at the beginning just because it's you know yeah she loves you is obviously in instantly accessible yes and, you know you don't necessarily get much more out of it by listening to it 10 times you just enjoy it well as but, a child i can tell you that i really didn't like eleanor rigby at all it just seems so weird with and so scary with those strings and now i think it might be mccartney's finest composition yeah well i mean a lot of people think that yeah absolutely yeah kind of a nice thing isn't it when it's it's almost like you have to put in work you know you yes have to work to appreciate mm -hmm. something so i think freak out is an example of an album that was doing something that the beatles weren't doing you know i i don't quite agree with this thing like they say about the white album that it's it's the beatles sort of spanning all the genres of music you know and that's not entirely true you know it's, there were areas that he didn't necessarily delve into i wouldn't call rocky raccoon a country song i would call it a country parody because it's not Absolutely. Doesn't really follow any of the tropes of a country song. It doesn't have a country beat, for example, on it. I also don't think that uh, Back in the USSR was particularly a Beach Boys parody. I think it's just a great rock shack. I think it's a great, yeah, a great rocker, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. A couple of notable singles as well. I mean, Good Vibrations. Uh, oh, fantastic. Obviously, yeah, it's obviously kind of allied to Pet Sounds. It was the sessions. It's not on the original album, so no, no. But it's around the same time, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's like including uh, Rain and Paperback Writer with Revolver. Yeah. Paint it black, obviously, with Stones. Um, there was a sort of tradition in England of kind of giving belly for money by not putting singles on albums. But uh, our American friends will know that in America it was quite different. They messed around with the Beatles albums and they had less on each album. And some of the American Beatles albums are probably like 25 minutes, which is laughable now. That would be like four songs nowadays. And they also stuck all the singles on the albums. So um, 
I'm sure American um, listeners have grown up with the albums and they will see the al- their American albums as, a, as an art form. But anyway, and then you had uh, I'm a Believer by the Monkees and you had I'm a Big Kinks fan as well, a couple of seminal singles, Sunny Afternoon and Dedicated Follower of Fashion. And then right in the middle of that, just to give us a lovely juxtaposition, the actual biggest selling um, single of that year, I don't know if it was in America or Britain or both, was Strangers in the Night by our friend uh, Frank. And again, very strange to see all these things going on at the same time, you know what I mean? Just one more, The Ballad of the Green Berets. So we've got our war theme there, the glorification of war right in the middle of all these other songs. It's a couple of uh, films as well. Um, Are you familiar with Blow Up, which is Antonioni? Oh, it was a favorite of mine when I was 14. Really? I, it should have been a favorite of mine when I was 14. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, um, the star is David Hemmings, and it's um, very much a swinging London film. He's a photographer, I think, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, you had Alfie with Michael Caine, and then you had another one that's quite notable. It's called The Wild Angels with Peter Fonda. Very much an inspiration for Easy Rider. It's another motorcycle film. And famously, uh, the lyric... We want to be free to do what we want to do. Do you know what song that's from? It's Primal Scream. It's on the Scream of Delica album. It's called Loaded. Just what is it that you want to do? We want to be free. We want to be free to to do what we want to do. And we want to get loaded. And we want to have a good time. And that's what we're going to do. Away, baby. Let's go. We're going to have a good time. It was the year of Fahrenheit 451, Francois Truffaut. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Ray yeah. Bradbury book. Yes. Yeah, Pointlessly yeah. remade recently. Oh, was it? Yeah. It's supposed to be remaking Brave New World. Oh, I don't God. even think there's any good film versions of that. I don't know. Maybe there are. But yeah, Fahrenheit 451 was another one of those. Um, yeah, when I say the word conspiracy, I'm not actually, I'm, I'm not using it as a pejorative. Mm-hmm. Uh, I won't go on a tangent about that because <laughs> my blog is basically all about that. But it's one of those films that's, 451 degrees is, is the temperature that books paper burns at, is that right? Well, that's what they say in the book anyway. That film and that book is about a dystopia where people aren't allowed to read books anymore. Mm-hmm. Books are all burned. It's, yeah. I think it was Truffaut's first English language film. Yeah, i would never heard of him doing any, any other ones, actually. Yeah, maybe he's done one since. Okay, so what I've got here, I've got basically a kind of chronology of the year. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's way too much to go into all of it. Actually, the, the Beatles didn't do much work until Revolver, which is April. So they actually had the longest break they'd had for a good number of years. Good and on them. Com- yeah, good on them, yeah. And they were yeah. coming out, obviously, of uh, the previous Christmas. 65 was Day Tripper, We Can Work It Out, single, and Rubber mm. Soul was number one. And very interestingly, on January the 5th, which is actually the only work they did until April, was um, they did some overdubbing for the Beatles at Shea Stadium film. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, were you aware that, are you aware that a lot of live albums are kind of spruced up in the studio? Do you think that's common knowledge? Well, I do know the Thin Lizzy Live and Dangerous was basically recorded in the studio. Oh, was it? Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Where maybe I gave too much away. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Thin Lizzy fans, uh, try and unhear that if you can. And, of course, Um, Frampton Comes Alive was in the studio. Oh, completely. Yeah. Uh, I think so, almost so, yeah. Obviously, the Shea Stadium footage wasn't in great shape, so uh, this is laughable. Really. They were using the PA that they used to announce the players because it's a um, baseball stadium, isn't it? Almost. Yeah. So it's interesting that they were kind of coming out of that Shea Stadium thing, which probably even to them, a lot of the songs they were playing then were like ancient history, you know? <laughs> of course. Because they, yeah, they're doing... That was August, wasn't it? So they were, mm. well, they hadn't done Rubber Soul yet. And then we're going to get on to the tours of 66. I mean, the music they'd just made on Revolver had really I, nothing to do with those tours, did it, really? I think either in 65 or 66, at one of the Shea gigs, Barbara Bach and Linda Eastman attended. I, but I can't, ah. put, I, I don't know then what year it was, but they were at one of those gigs. Yeah, I might find that out and I'll, uh, I'll put that in the notes or something. Yeah. All right, so let's go to March the 4th where John Lennon gave an interview to Maureen Cleave of the London Evening Standard, now a free paper, so you can get all that bad news for free as you're coming home from a a stressful day at the office. So the the article was called How Does a Beetle Live? John Lennon Lives Like This. Now, we'll talk about the repercussions of this interview and uh, the absurdity of it, but um, do you want to tell us about that, Owen? 
Well, it, it's a quite an interesting one. It's about his home life in Weybridge. Says he is much the same as he was before. This is Maureen Cleave, who was about 25, 26 when she wrote this. Hmm. He still peers down his nose, arrogant as an eagle, although contact lenses have righted the short sight that originally caused the expression. He looks more like Henry VIII than ever now than his face is filled out. He is just as imperious, just as unpredictable, indolent, disorganized, childish, vague, charming, and quick-witted. Very beautifully written, but quite contradictory, don't you think? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I was going to say, as you were saying this, I was thinking um, the Mark Lewison book, Tune In, which I refer to a lot on this podcast. I remember as I was um, reading it, it was so long, I knew I was never going to read it twice, so I thought I'd make notes on it. And one of the things that stood out was the number of adjectives he used to describe John Lennon and the number of contradictory adjectives as well. So you're absolutely right. Give us a picture of what you think his life was like at that time. Where was he in March 66? Well, she's painting a picture of, of blissful or unblissful domesticity. She's talking about how he's got a large house, he's got a wife and a son. There's a cat called after his Aunt Mimi. There's a purple dining room. And then, of course, there's the litany, the myriad of objects. He pauses over objects he still fancies. A huge altar crucifix of a Roman Catholic nature with IHS on it. A pair of crutches. A present from George. An enormous Bible he bought in Chester. His gorilla suit. I thought I might need a gorilla suit. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, it was a weird, it was a weird existence because um, both uh, Maureen Cleave and Hunter Davis said that John Lennon often wouldn't know what day it was, and he had this weird sort of nocturnal night owl kind of existence, and uh, he would sort of emerge bleary eyed. Uh, we know that he was a major weed smoker at that time. I'm sure he was a daily poker, as they say, and. Uh, also, Hunter Davis, when he was researching the Beatles book, which was around this time, 66, 67, he said uh, one day he turned up at John Lennon's house and John Lennon decided uh, he wasn't going to talk that day. So I don't know whether he wrote anything down or they communicated telepathically. <laughs> I don't know. I've made numerous comparisons with Marlon Brando on this podcast. And uh, listeners, if I've got any left, are probably <laughs> sick of hearing me talk about it. But Marlon Brando did exactly the same thing when Coppola came to his house to do a screen test for The Godfather. So... Very interesting. They're just, I think they're just operating on a, I wouldn't say a higher plane, but a different plane. So um, the average man on the street would probably wouldn't have the nerve or the confidence or the strangeness to say if someone went round their house, oh, today we're not going to talk. But these kind of people, they did, you know. And we know that he would often sort of say random stuff, and I think the randomness of some of his comments is what got him into trouble. But uh, another description, she said, a young man, famous, loaded, and waiting for something. And um, as you said, all these objects, you know, you had the board games. A lot of them are quite childish, actually, like racing cars and board games. And she talks about George and Ringo, because there was three of them living in suburbia, would come round and play with these. So it's it's almost like perhaps they were growing up too quickly and they wanted to be children again. What do you think? I think there's something to be said about that. I think you've got to remember how young the guys were. John Ringo were 25, George and Paul were 22, 23. Mm. I mean, the young guys should have been out in clubs just being young, youthful idiots that are trying to be the mouthpieces of the world. Yeah, it's a lot well, of pressure. They were certainly out in clubs, weren't they? But uh, it's just funny. Well, yeah. You know about, I guess, all the, the ad lib and the bag of nails and all this kind of club scene. But mm -hmm. It's a, that funny thing where famous people a lot of the time have to hang out with other famous people because <laughs> they can get this kind of protection so they can go to these clubs and it'll be closed off from uh, the ordinary people yes uh, yeah and i think famous people kind of get tarred with the brush of you can't help it really of feeling like you're above everybody else or the public think that because you've yes. got to be enclosed away from them like as i've said a few times on this podcast john lennon couldn't have a normal house Mm -hmm. and a normal life so you kind of it's inevitable almost well yes um you you hear stories about john entwistle and in the who who's living in a, in a castle oh yeah absolutely yeah, yeah yeah um some other stuff that maureen cleave said she said um his possessions have got the upper hand which i thought mm -hmm. was interesting she described him of course as the laziest person in england what do you think about that it's part of his charm, it's part of his curse. We never have had time to, before to do anything but just be Beatles, John Lennon says. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And of course, it, I mean, she's talking about physically lazy, obviously. And during the interview, he yeah. says, oh, the only physical thing I'd be bothered with is sex. But yeah. obviously, you know, mentally, he wasn't lazy, put it that way. So. But yeah, and often it wasn't just, it, it was with more women than just Cynthia, it seems. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's clear, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, maybe Maureen herself, but... <laughs> 
Well, yeah, well she denied us, but... Yeah, she <laughs> did, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so get, let's get on to the quote. So can you give us the famous uh, quote about uh, Jesus? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so what's interesting about it is it's it's almost tossed away. It's halfway through the article. Mm. You know, it says, um, experience has sown few seeds of doubts in him, not that his mind is closed, but it's closed around whatever he believes at the time. Christianity will, will go, he said. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right, and I will be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Jesus was all right, but his disciples are thick and ordinary. It's yeah. them twisting it that ruins it for me. Absolutely. Yeah, well, he had been reading this book called The Passover Plot, and I think I think he sort of delved in and out of religion through his short mm -hmm. adult life. Really, it wasn't just something he made up from the top of his head. It, I think a lot of it came from this book. And He said, you know, people in England are used to, to me babbling and saying stuff off the top of my head, so there wasn't really any reaction yeah. that I know of, you know? Yeah, it might have just been another gobby atheist or the silly beetle. Yeah, exactly. I think them winning the MBEs probably upset more people than in 1965. Yeah, would well, you remember what he said about that? He said... Uh, a lot of people who were complaining got theirs for killing people yeah. in the army. We got ours not for killing people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've just recorded a talk with Jude uh, Sutherland Kessler, which will be on the podcast after your one. Oh, fantastic. Uh, we were talking about how um, in even 64, the mask was just starting to slip slightly. Mm -hmm. You know, that just occasionally you get like, there's a photo of him coming out of a brothel in Amsterdam. And then there's the there's an occasion where the reporter says to him, "What did you do on the plane on the way to America?" And he said, "Oh, we got stoned." <laughs> <laughs> then the reporter says, "Well, I know you're only joking." And he goes, "Well, actually, I'm not." <laughs> <laughs> but that thing about the MBE, I mean, that's pretty controversial, really. You know, they seem to just get away with it. I think mm -hmm. John Lennon said that the journalists, everybody wanted to keep the party going, so they. <laughs> well, maybe uh, Lennon, of course, returned to his in 1969. Absolutely, yeah, he did, he did. The only other stuff from the Maureen Cleave, some other other objects he had, you were talking about that earlier, he had a suit of armour called Sydney. Yeah, well, he, it sounds, it looks like he's a voracious reader. He's got Swift, Tennyson, Huxley, Orwell, costly leather-bound editions of Tolstoy, Oscar mm. Wilde, Little Women, 41 years in India, my apologies, and Curiosities of Natural History. I mean, that's pretty... Of course, he was also, in later years, a, a firm reader of Vonnegut. Oh, Vonnegut, yeah, absolutely. And Fred Seaman, who um, who was his personal assistant for the last uh, year or two of his life, he mm. said, you know, John Lennon had an incredible knowledge. Um, a lot of it was actually to do with ancient history, like ancient Egypt and things. Absolutely. He was a bloody good writer himself. I mean, Skywriting's a fantastic book, as is in his, in his own right. What was it? In his own right, Spanish in the works, and then Skywriting by word of mouth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah the other thing uh, that was interesting, she talked about John Lennon, of course, had a Rolls Royce that he, in 67, he got it painted in psychedelic colours. And she yeah. said that in, inside the Rolls Royce, there was a TV, a folding bed, a fridge, oh, a writing desk, and a telephone. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking there's a little bit of a parallel with um, Elvis. I, yes. I read this extensive biography of him a couple of years ago. And um, Elvis, of course, famously died or was found in the bathroom. And the, the kind of myth is that he died on the toilet. I think that just kind of titillates people somehow. But... Yeah. Whether he did or not, his bathroom, I think, actually had two TVs in it, and he had tables in there. And this is a very interesting parallel between Elvis and John. They like to have everything around them, you know, so they can hang mm. out in their car and, and almost live there, you know, or live in, yeah. the, in the bathroom. You know, it's that in interesting thing. Absolutely. Well, well, Cynthia said she got used to John in the middle of the night just going, going and finding a piece of paper to write on for a lyric. Yeah, absolutely, and there's this funny thing of like when you don't have to wake up to do a day job, so to speak, although obviously they did have a, a mm. job which was incredibly demanding, you yes. can kind of, you know, the hours of the day, you don't have normal meal times. I mean, me, mm. even in my own small way as an English teacher, I've abandoned normal meal times because I teach my classes, you know, they come up at strange times, you know, it could be early in the morning, late yes. in the evening. Absolutely. So, and then finally, the, the quote, he said, uh, there's something else I'm going to do, something I must do, only I don't know what it is. Yes. And, you know, he met uh, Yoko about six months after that. And they, well, some people actually said that they started a relationship earlier than 68, but officially it was uh, 68. Yeah. All right. So um, we come to April the 6th. 
which was mm-hmm. uh, another landmark day because this was the beginning of the recording of Revolver. The first song to be recorded was a song called Mark One, which became Tomorrow Never Knows. And um, for the sort of casual fans of the Beatles, I, I would urge you to play uh, From Me to You and then play Tomorrow Never Knows and realize that it was three years between those two recordings, which is absolutely just mind blowing to me. Unbelievable. Yeah, really incredible. Yeah. And um, as I said earlier, at the beginning of the year, they didn't really have any work apart from doing this Shea Stadium, these overdubs. April 6th was the first official work they'd done of the year. Mm-hmm. What do you think of Tomorrow Never Knows? Do you think it still sounds sort of vaguely futuristic even now? I don't think anyone could predict the future as well as they did. I mean, it's just shimmering with all those, you know, tubral Tibetan bells and the hypnotic mm. vocals and the fulment of drums, which Ringo's drumming preempts John Bonham's work in Kashmir and Levy Breaks and all these incredible mm. 70s prog. It had that kind of drone idea because obviously it's on one chord and yeah. they gave credit, Paul gave credit to George Martin for not dismissing it and for saying, oh, okay, they're, they're giving me a song with one chord that's a bit strange, but let's, let's run with it. Well, George Martin, although he was painted by Lennon and McCartney as quite square in some interviews, he was he was quite avant-garde. He did a lot of backward tape looping, and you know he he did a lot of spoken word, and he did the goons, and I mean he had a lot of avant-garde things going for him. Oh, absolutely, and and the funny thing about him, I don't know if listeners know this, but um, he was very working class. I mean, incredible mm-hmm. when you listen to his voice. I mean, yeah. All right, uh, chaps. Yeah. Well, chaps. Yeah, it's sort of squadron leader Martin, as some people call him. <laughs> yes, and um, there's that bit in uh, when Paul did the George film in 2011, where he mm. he's talked about being in a in a cop pilot. He said, "It looks like producing a record," and I thought, "I think it's a bit different fighting in a war to producing a record, Paul." <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, as you said, I mean George had done these comedy records. Funnily enough, um, again credit to Mark Lewison for this, but now we know, of course, that. He'd done a lot of records where he was creating sound pictures, which is exactly what he said about yes. his work with the Beatles in 66 and 67. The other thing is that there'd also been Indian musicians yes. in, um, in Abbey Road because he'd done the, the album Songs for Swinging Sellers with Peter Sellers. Um, yeah. Kenneth Womack has also written two books on George Martin, which are excellent. Yeah, that's right. Maximum mm-hmm. Volume and Sound, sound Picture. Picture. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's the other thing, um, talking about how quick the progress was. Because the first time they entered uh, Abbey Road, or EMI as it was known then, was June 62. Mm-hmm. And of course in April 66, as we are here, as you said, there was, um, John said, I want to sound like the Dalai Lama and I want the sound of Tibetan monks. And another idea he had was uh, to get that kind of swirly thing that they got with, um, you know, using artificial double tracking, which was invented by one of their engineers and using the Leslie revolving speaker. John Lennon wanted to swing from one side of the studio to the other. And they said, well, you don't need to do that, John. You can stay in one place, and we'll, we've got stuff that will make it sound like you're swinging to and fro. So <laughs> the idea that these fresh-faced scousers enter the studio in June yeah. 62, knowing nothing, and then less than four years later, one of them wants to swing across the studio. It's, just, it's mind-blowing. It's amazing stuff. It's quite funny. Yeah, it is. So April to June, they were kind of engaged in recording Revolver. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go through the songs of Revolver later on. Yes. Another key date was May the 1st, was the day of the enemy poll winners party. And this was actually their last concert in England. And for those interested, again, I would... um, The actual 1965 version of the poll winners party, I think, is still on YouTube. And it's it's an incredible, like, who's who of uh, British rock. You know, everyone you can imagine. Uh, the 66 version, again, it may be available online, I can't remember, but it's kind of strange to see them. That there's not quite the enthusiasm for it, you know? I don't think their hearts were in it by 66. Yeah, that's it. I mean, they'd moved on so quickly, you know? Yeah. When, when you've recorded Tomorrow Never Knows, I mean, can you really go back to playing three chords on stage? Yeah, that's it. I mean, She Loves You was obviously 63. I think they'd abandoned that by 64. And you just think about... As we're saying, I mean, that must just just seem light years away to them. It's it's quite Absolutely. remarkable. And then um, June the tenth was uh, the release of Paperback Writer with mm-hmm. Rain. So let let's focus on Rain, obviously, because that's a John Lennon song. That's one of your favourites, isn't it? Oh, it's super. I think I consider it the the, the best of the Beatles B sides, um, mm-hmm. considering the Strawberry Fields is a double A side. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. So if we're talking strictly B sides, this is just mind blowing. 
I feel it's right to be a B side, unlike I'm the Walrus, which I think should have been the A side. I don't think Rain is commercial, but I love how it follows Paperback Writer, uh, a, a melody with you know vibrating, lacerating guitars to just out their backward guitars and thundering drums and idiosyncratic lyrics. Yeah, absolutely. What do you interpret the lyrics? I mean, there've been various ones. A, l a lot of it was about um, the line when the rain comes, they run and hide their heads. Was supposed to be about squares kind of shielding themselves from the truth or something. <laughs> Is there any interpretation that you either your own or, or stuff you've found or seen? I think it's just it must have been from a trip. Um, I mean, George seemed to do the same, like take out a guitar on a sunny day, as we saw in Here Comes the Sun, and mm -hmm. I'd say he probably just responded to what was in front of him. And of course, there's that conflicting story about the backwards tapes because George Martin said that he'd introduced it and they mm. liked it and John Lennon's story was like oh, I came home from the studio I sparked up a fat joint <laughs> and I must have put it on backwards yeah sorry for the terrible impression that's um, alright <laughs> I, I, I I've done some appalling impressions on this show too <laughs> well I think yours are a bit better than mine I must say oh thank you Maybe, perhaps we could have got Simon in to do that one but... <laughs> <laughs> we hi love you, Simon. Simon if, yeah, hi to Simon if you're listening in Madrid. There's that, and yeah, yeah. it's a, such a strange thing to have it on the on the B side. But uh, Paul's thing, um, he said in an interview, was that in the 50s when he was first buying records, mm -hmm. he'd often get very cheated by the B side because what they actually used to do. Sorry for millennials, by the way. <laughs> a B side, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Singles uh, used to be bits of vinyl, and they were seven inches. And you had one song on one side and one song on the other. But no, Paul used to say that a lot of the B-sides in the 50s were just the same song with the vocal taken off, so you could sing along to Ooh. it. <laughs> well, of course, well, of course he did that for Give Ireland Back to the Irish. He just put an instrumental on the, on the B-side. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, it's him and Henry McCulloch, I think, just playing the guitars. Oh, it's a bit yeah. cheeky, considering he was complaining about it. Well, I suppose they had to get on the air as quickly as they could. I think they had two days, so they didn't have a choice. Yeah, that's the problem with uh, doing stuff about current politics. It moves mm. on so quickly, you've got to get in there quickly. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, he was saying that he would often feel cheated. So the Beatles um, famously had uh, incredible B-sides. I mean, even the early ones, I'll get you, and you can't do that was a B-side. Absolutely. This, love this boy is superb. This boy, uh, yes it is as well, which is yeah. Jude Kessler's favourite. Okay. She's then, uh, a woman who understands. She's a woman, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Superb. Revolution as well later on. Incredible yep. stuff. And then uh, five days after the release of Rain, we had um, the American album Yesterday and Today, which had a rather interesting cover. Are you aware of that? I think they butchered it, if I'm out honest. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the cover of that album? Can you describe it's it to us? Dismembered baby doll heads and, and meat, and the boys t are wearing white jackets reminiscent of uh, Clockwork Orange. It was banned, we know that, but uh, yeah. I don't know what how much furor there was, or furore, I don't know how you pronounce that word, at the time. But um, yeah, amazing stuff, because they're still the mop tops, but yeah. uh, as we'll see later on, I mean, uh, this was just one controversy after another for the next few months. But um, John's comment, of course, said it was as relevant as Vietnam. There was the rumour that they were, they were protesting against their company butchering their records. Ah, yes, of course. The photographer is Robert Whittaker, and we should say, just for the record, that apparently was actually his idea. The Beatles didn't um, didn't have the idea themselves, but they all have these very strange uh, looks on their faces, these sort of strange beatific smiles. I wonder what yes. that was all about. I think they yes. embraced it quite wholeheartedly. Were any of them I reluctant? I think George, whether he was reluctant or not, he definitely in the anthology interview says he th it was quite childish of them to do. No, I mean, I thought it was uh, very interesting and... Uh, ahead of their time again well the photographer as well absolutely it's funny how people come to regret like you know the Manic Street Preachers on top of the Pops playing faster James Dean Bradfield wore a balaclava now the guys yeah. think that that was the stupidest thing they ever did when it, when most people think that was just amazing of them to make a political point like that I don't know why they would regret that I mean, yeah. they're obviously a different person at that time and that's who you are at that time yeah. it doesn't mean that you do it 30 years later you know but, no not there's a, you do it in your 20s not in your 50s yeah, that's it. Yeah. So then they went on tour. In order was Germany, Japan, Philippines, and the USA. I'll just sort of zip through Germany and Japan because it won't take very long. So basically, in Germany, of course, they made it to Hamburg, 
And again, you know, they first arrived in Hamburg as a bum group. And we've got recordings from a just before they went to Hamburg. And some of it is absolutely dreadful. And I mean, that is six years ago. John went to visit Astrid Kirscher. And mm -hmm. Astrid gave John some letters from Stu. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And again, I mean, Stu had died more or less exactly four years earlier. I mean, it must have seemed like a lifetime. April 62. Yeah. So, yeah, just over four years. And then um, next stop was Japan. And they performed at the Budokan which was a martial arts center, but some right-wing reactionaries actually issued death threats because it was a sacred place. Of course they did. Yeah. Have you seen any of the videos from the Budokan? I have seen one or two, yes. Yeah, they're quite readily available. There's actually two shows. I think it's afternoon, evening. And there's a performance of If I Needed Someone. It's so ragged. I mean, they couldn't hear themselves properly, although they could yeah. probably hear themselves better there than in some other concerts. But uh, they're trying to do paperback writer and they're struggling a bit with the harmonies. And then well, that, that was a very hard song to pull off on stage anyway, considering that there were two or three guitars on the track. I think yeah. even Paul actually did the guitar on that one, I think. He does, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, there's some clips and he's trying to sing paperback writer and his, and his mic's obviously loose. Uh, mm -hmm. Not unlike Triscoll Tavern, eh? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's for our friends in Madrid, yeah. No one else will understand yes. that. No, he's singing and the mic keeps uh, moving out of position. So he's got in between the lines and playing bass. He's got to try and get the mic back. And it just it's just so incredible to think that they're like these huge celebrities. But it's yeah. so small scale in comparison. You know, I mean, 50,000 people is not small scale, but their road crew was like five scousers. You know, <laughs> it's just a load of old <laughs> mates from Liverpool. <laughs> oh, and of course, the, their hearts weren't quite into it anymore. No, no, absolutely not. Well, like I was saying earlier, they, there's this weird juxtaposition. It's the same, actually, for Pink Floyd uh, a sort of year or two later. What they did live had nothing to do with what they were recording, really, or barely anything mm -hmm. to do. You know, so Pink Floyd, Sid Barrett era, they were, they were doing these sort of 20-minute freakouts, and the, the audience want to hear, you know, see Emily play in Arnold Lane. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? Very. Yeah. And then they go on to Manila, July the 3rd to the 5th. So basically, I'll summarize again. So they go to Manila. First of all, of course, they, they carried uh, marijuana around pretty much everywhere they went by now. And John Lennon was actually the one who used to carry it, apparently. When Paul tried it in 1980, we saw how that happened for him. <laughs> yeah, well, he wasn't very subtle, was he? Was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's in my hand language. Yeah, according to Neil Aspinall, and basically it was very weird from when they started. I think the security was a bit lax. So they mm. were taken on a boat. And uh, I think they were very paranoid that their weed was going to be seized and that, they, you know, they might end up in jail or something. And then, of course, the famous story is um, they were invited to see Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos, mm -hmm. you know, an official ceremony. I'm not sure if the full story is completely accepted, but I think Brian Epstein did refuse. And basically, it was one of their rare days off and they... Mm -hmm. Not clear exactly whether they refused or or Brian cancelled it because they said they were tired or something like that. Anyway, of course, subsequently, we now know that Marcos, uh, Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos were very corrupt. Um, they were an example of sort of third world leaders that were, well, some would say corrupted by the US or US um, corporations. They, they do this thing where they kind of, they set up infrastructure contracts in poor countries and basically make the leader rich and impoverish the country. I don't think the Beatles planned this, but in the end it was one in the eye for, you know, a basically corrupt leader. I don't know, again, whether it was common knowledge about that. Probably not, that, that they mm -hmm. were corrupt or whatever. But in the, in the anthology, they, they have this amazing thing where they, you know, they used to stay in um, twin beds in hotel rooms. I think it was um, George said that, or Ringo, they ordered breakfast, you know, sort of bacon and eggs probably in those days. And then they're actually watching themselves on TV, not appearing at the at the Royal Palace. Presidential Palace, sorry. <laughs> I can, I can just imagine. They're, they're lying in their hotel room, watching themselves not appearing. <laughs> just so uh, we were watching the TV and we just weren't there. It felt like a, re a regular day in Pepperland. Beetle Land was never normal, was it? Yeah. Um, no. And there's a press conference, which is actually at London Airport. They called it London Airport, presumably that's Heathrow, where they talk about Manila. And um, there's a few famous things where um, 
John Lennon says, oh, you know, they said, uh, you get treated like ordinary passenger, ordinary passenger. We got to the airport and our road managers had a lot of trouble trying to get the equipment in because the escalators had been turned off and things. So we got there and we got um, uh, put into the transit lounge. And then we got pushed around from one corner of the lounge to, to another, you know. You treat like ordinary passenger, ordinary yeah. passenger, they were saying. They <laughs> said, ordinary passenger, what, he doesn't get kicked, does he? <laughs> and so they started knocking over our road managers and things, and everyone was falling all over they the place. They started worrying you when the road manager got knocked over. Yeah, and I swear got... there was 30 of them. What do you say there were? Well, I saw five in sort of outfits, you know, that were sort of doing it, the actual kicking and and booing and shouting. Did you get kicked in there? No, I was very delicate and moved every time they touched me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, thought I was petrified. I, don't, I could have been kicked and not known it. I just, I just never go to any nut houses again. After this happened, of course, they had to get out of their hotel and they were being manhandled quite majorly. They, I think they did actually think their lives were in danger. And John and somebody else hid behind some nuns. You couldn't make it up, could you? Um, well, you, so. you do hear this story of when John and George went on holiday with their wives, uh, Cynthia and Patty had to dress up as, ch as chambermaids to escape. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crazy. The sort of subtext to all this, uh, Brian Epstein, of course, was would be dead in uh, just over a year. He was a very, very nervous person. I don't think he could really handle the situation he was in. They went home via New Delhi, so India. Mm -hmm. Brian was breaking out in hives. He had hives all over his body. He was in a terrible, nervous state. Oh, dear. And um, they got on a plane, and him and Mal Evans, who's one of the roadies, got called to the front of the plane. And uh, the famous thing is that Mal said to, I think it was George, he said, tell Lil I love her, meaning his wife, because he genuinely thought he might. Yes. I don't know what they were expecting to happen. Like Maybe they were going to get thrown out of the plane or something. Oh, um, God. So anyway, they end up in India, which is obviously is very significant for George because he'd go back Absolutely. a few months later. Yeah. And then on the 31st of July is the publication of um, an infamous edition of Date Book, which was a teen magazine. I always find it a bit weird, not that the thing was taken out of context, but that, that it was a, in a teen magazine. Why would American teens give a shit what John Lennon thought of religion? But... Well, I, I suppose there were a lot of religious teens... Well, yeah, of course, you've got the Bible Belt. I'm, I'm just wondering, yeah. the, the only reason I'm saying that is that I would have thought that these teen magazines, you know, even now, they're, they're just fairly frivolous, aren't they, really, the content? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And the next day, August the 1st, is when um, this they announced these Beatle burnings. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, and of course, with a great dry humour, one of the Beatles said, well, it wasn't too bad, because when all the furor had died down, they bought them all back, so... <laughs> well, they, well, people had to buy the records to burn them. Well, there you go. Yeah, I wonder if, it, yeah, I wonder if there's some crazy people who actually went out and bought them and didn't have them and bought them just to burn them. Maybe they did. And that's that's just throwing money up in flames. <laughs> John, of course, said um, in in a December 1966 Look magazine interview, mm -hmm. I said we were more popular than Jesus, which is a fact. I believe Jesus was right, Buddha was right, and all those people like that are right. They're all saying the same thing, and I believe it. I believe what Jesus actually said, the basic things he laid down and about love and goodness, and not what people say he said. That makes it pretty clear. I mean, of course, Jesus was uh, kind of a hippie, wasn't he? And, and a socialist. Lennon had a hippie face. So, mm -hmm. yeah. He went on to look a bit like a visual representation of Jesus, didn't he? With the beard and the center parted hair and everything. Absolutely. And there we're going to leave it for part one of my talk with Owen. So we've reached August. For those who don't know, 1966 so well, um, there's still plenty happening. They're just about to go to America to uh, face the fallout from John's remark, which, as we talked about, had got reproduced in a teen magazine in America. And a flippant remark had, had become uh, suddenly the focal point of uh, John Lennon's various remarks. They have the famous final concert in San Francisco. And then uh, quite a long break, the longest they'd had for a few years, and came back very, very different people. But we'll get to all that. I hope to get it posted in the next week or so. And so you'll have part two of that one. And then I've got, as I said earlier, a couple more interviews in the can. So plenty coming up. So thanks for listening. And I'll see you all soon. There goes the music. Take care. Bye. <laughs>